me, let me push you both, right? So one way of um, that some people certainly could read, uh, could hear what you've both just said is, you're two privileged white moms with privileged white kids, and it doesn't matter actually what school you go to, and as long as you, your kids stay physically safe, you're gonna be fine because it's already predetermined because, right, you have, um, Courtney, you use the term opportun opportunity hoarding in your opening remark. So for folks who don't know, right, this idea that uh, privileged groups often use in the racial context, so privileged white people, you know, in a sense, hoard the opportunity among themselves, right, and other people who look like them. So that that's, for example, what, you know, elite private schools might do, right? We're going to just take all that privilege and the social capital and so on in those schools and we're going to keep it into within our group. Um, well, you know, if you um, benefit, right, if you are in a privileged group that benefits from that privilege, so your kids will be fine no matter what, that's one thing, then you can afford to make that choice. But if you're not in such a group, if you are perhaps a poor white family, right? If you're um, yeah, poor of any kind or you know, otherwise feel disadvantaged in some way, well then education actually is more key to upward mobility and you can't afford, right? So, and then of course there is, um, you know, and you, you've heard all of these arguments and, and counterpoints, but certainly they're worth mentioning. I won't mention them all. But there also will be people of color, right? Parents of children of color who say, wait a second, right? Are these two, you know, well-meaning white liberal women really saying that um, my kids, my child of color will benefit from being next to their child of color, right? So this is sort of this noblesse oblige. Or not their child of, of power. Right, next to their white child, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, say, well, that's problematic, right? Is it really the case that, you know, why can't we have, quote unquote, segregated, you know, predominantly uh, people of color schools that also serve our kids? Anyway, there are obviously more objections that you, again, will be familiar with, but what do you say to those folks? Um, I mean, I think the answers are really depending on, you know, what the conversation is about, but, you know, for families of color, it's real, right? You're going to show up with your, you know, black daughter, and the reality is she is more likely to be disciplined at higher rates than my white daughter, right? She is less likely to be tested for gifted than my white daughter. Like, all of that stuff is really real, and yet we've done desegregation on the backs of black and brown kids entirely, right? I mean, for not entirely, for the most part. So, you know, when we're doing, when we're trying to work toward equity, it, it, you know, if that's the goal of desegregation, I think that it really doesn't, it, it shouldn't be on the backs of people who, you know, have these things stacked against them because of the structural racism that we're facing down. So, you know, that isn't, I don't think, the work of families who feel like they're not going to be treated equally or equitably, right? And you know that could go with uh, that could be the same storyline for people who you know are kids who are growing up in poverty, kids who are neuroatypical, right? Who are facing down different challenges. But there, you know, there are a lot of middle class white kids who are going to school, and that's the place to start this work. And those are the kids who aren't going to integrating spaces. Mindy, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I always feel that, uh, especially public school, is a reflection of what we want our society to be. And um, we can choose as parents to keep our children in what would be considered more um, segregated. If we looked honestly at some of the schools, maybe we would gravitate towards based on how our friends or people we know might label them. But at the end of the day, our children are citizens. Uh, our children are going to go out in the world and they're going to work with people and they're going to interact with people and they're going to have meaningful relationships with people and they're going to make decisions. And I think that uh, my job as a mother, uh, I have lots of jobs, but one of them is to make just a really uh, a thoughtful um, uh, citizen, two of them, um, that are going to go into the world and try and um, learn from people. And, and I want to create a situation where um, my children are going to be white men someday. 
um, right? So they're, um, they are already in a position, uh, looking at our culture, they're already in a position of privilege. Um, and so because of that, I, I want to do my best to make sure that they are, uh, they kind of look at the world around them and people around them and really understand uh, and ask, uh, you know, look, look at, for them to be in a situation, for them to be a minority for a second in their life, there's, they're not going to be harmed by that, and it, only good things can happen. And so I, I it was you know kind of echoing some of the stuff that Courtney, Courtney said here that um, we uh, and I say we as just you know white families and, and our white family and it's just part of the group here um, we're set up to kind of take more resources. That's how the system's set up. And so I'm, I'm trying to intentionally as a as a mother and a person um, trying to create um, a scenario, try to raise children that might be more mindful and thoughtful of the world around them. And I feel like that has to start at school because that's the only way we can, I can get them to a point where they can maybe be more thoughtful as they you know, enter society. 